All right, welcome everybody. We'll get uh, we'll get going. Um, so the title of today's panel is really just talking about open source and how to how to make money, how to build it, how to build a business. And my name's Ryan Floyd. I'm a I'm a venture investor with uh, Storm Ventures and have funded a bunch of open source companies. But but really, I think who you want to hear from are people that have actually built them. Uh, so Adam uh, Johnson's from uh, Mitakura. Uh, Chris McGowan is from Piston now, Cisco, and Ben Charian was at Ink Tank and now part of Red Hat. So three experts, I think, in terms of really thinking through the business models around around open source. So uh, maybe maybe just to kind of get it going to set kind of set the context, we had a conversation before the panel about the different models. So maybe that's a good place to start. Just talking about how you how you can build a business around open source and take it from there. Okay, I can start. Um, Mitokura had started a um, network virtualization platform. It was fully proprietary originally, and at the OpenStack Paris Summit, we open sourced the code. Um, we built you know, a GUI and some other features on top, um, so we ended up having an open core model. Um, so I think that's definitely one of the models which is, is quite popular. There's a bunch of other companies in the space doing that. Um, so that's, that's what I know, um, just for a little bit of background. We can go through other. Well, let's come back to why yeah. you guys open source in a second. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, why don't you talk about the model at Piston and how Cisco is going to open source everything? All right. <laughs> um, so Piston's <laughs> model was actually an entirely proprietary central or dis decentralized distributed controller that used and orchestrated OpenStack. So we were really about like anything that touched OpenStack, we would open source. Anything that touched our distributed system uh, that we called Moxie was ours. Um, and since we've been acquired by Cisco, there's talk internally about open sourcing Moxie and releasing that. It still has to go through lawyers and you know executives and all of the fun, happy fun thing that happens when you work for a company that has more people than a small city. Hi. Um, so um, at Ink Tank, what we did was a open core model. Uh, actually, we started out being straight open source. And as we started getting some traction in the market, and actually kind of right before the acquisition, um, we decided to, to take our, our uh, management tools, which we call Calamari, and make that proprietary. Uh, once we got acquired by Red Hat, we open sourced everything. Uh, but uh, it, I think to answer the question that you're asking, uh, less so out of context of what we've all done, but more in terms of what are the business models, um, you have companies that do pure open source, and generally that's a professional services and support play. You have open core, which means that maybe a big chunk of it or, or uh, a huge part of the value prop is the uh, open source part, but there are pieces that are added on top of it that are, have different licensing structures, depending on what kind of model that is. There's uh, some companies that do dual licensing, where they might have an open model, like MySQL did dual licensing, where you have an open model, but if you want to put it into a commercial product, it's a proprietary license. Um, and as a whole, uh, you know, a lot of these tend to be professional services heavy companies, and as they start to build out usually the proprietary piece of it, that's where those sorts of subscriptions scale out. Um, and then you have businesses like Google and the such that rely heavily on open source, but deliver a you know a service or a proprietary solution. And I think what um, Chris was doing at Piston is interesting because they were delivering a full OpenStack distribution that, but it wasn't just about OpenStack. That was completely proprietary. So the pieces of it that they used were open, but what they delivered to the end user was proprietary. Yeah, and I guess to some extent, I'd like to go back to the dual license thing. It, it often tends to be from a business model perspective that you start evaluating and start describing commercial uses more and more liberally uh, to the point where if you're just hosting a website, the MySQL sales organization actually would come to you and say, hey, you need to pay us, um, which sort of gets away from the open model and the, op the, the GPL license that they were using. So, so how, so let's, so, we'll, and we'll take questions here in, in, in a second, if you just kind of bear with us to set, set the context. So the most simplest form is this services model. And I think most people think of Red Hat, right? Uh, and that's not all Red Hat does, but that, you know, is kind of the epitome company. There's other companies like Hortonworks that are, that are newer. Um, do you guys think you can build a company with that sort of model today? I mean, Hortonworks sort of 
made it work? Uh, let me answer the Red Hat question. Uh, Red Hat would not consider themselves a services company, um, even though you know the, a big part of the value prop of Red Hat is having good good technical support and good services function. They also have professional services function, but what they do as a whole is they sell subscriptions. And because of just the complexity of Linux, their main product is Linux, and the complexity of Linux and being able to uh, not only certify what you know hardware platforms are there, but be able to handpick what packages there are and have influence in what is bundled in there. Um, that curation, I think, is important and, and valuable for end users. So. Um, when Red Hat goes to market, um, they're considered more of a, a subscription uh, business rather than a, a services business. Cloudera, on the other hand, um, I, I think when you look at the numbers, when you look at, 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 at what, what people are at least anecdotally saying about that, uh, is it seems to be more of a professional services play and less of a subscription play. And I think that in emerging markets where technology is not as defined as much, um, it tends to be more professional services rather than subscriptions. I think uh, to, to some extent about Red Hat specifically is that Red Hat modeling themselves as a subscription license is more of an, art, uh, an accounting artifact, not what people are paying for. Nobody wants a license, a subscription license to Red Hat. What they want is at 4.30 in the morning when your email server fell over or whatever to be able to call up and have someone fix it. And it's the services sure. aspect that people care about and yeah. what they're actually paying for. And I would just say, if, if as a startup, um, if you're looking oh, at God, a... Ben. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> just got to keep him honest. <laughs> so as, as a startup, if you're looking at a services um, business model, I think that the biggest challenge is finding someone to invest in that, right? Because the challenges in doing that is how do you scale out services because it's tied to humans. Right. Um, so I think that that's, that's one of the bigger challenges. So generally people are looking at are what are the ways to to build a business on open source that's not services dependent even though there it's i think it's pretty hard to escape any amount of services it's it's a necessary part to get the product out there um, especially around OpenStack, for example but um, still i think uh, that's the hasn't the the reason why people hesitate to you know focus entirely on that as the main model right. and Hortonworks and Cloudera managed to sort of scale their services business by doing it around training and, and uh, licensing and consulting around those sorts of not one-to-one. -one. So you can have a class of 30 people. You only have to hire one trainer for that. But they can also do the next class and the next class and the next class. And as you move more and more of the training, which is professional services income into self-service, self-managed uh, web classes like a MOOC, uh, you can actually scale professional services income in a way that we previously weren't able to do. You know, as an investor, I guess what I'd add to that too is when you think about like Cloudera Hortonworks or Red Hat, they're enormously large projects with a very, very large user base. When you think of something like OpenStack, it's a combination of many, arguably, smaller projects and a smaller base of users. And I think that, you know, there's elements of that that makes it difficult as well, potentially, in terms of how you think about building it around services versus, um, you know, some kind of product. So, can I, can I add one thing? No. no okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I forgot, to, I forgot to talk about service providers as well, like managed service providers, particularly in the OpenStack context. I mean, oh, it's right. a very valuable business model. It's very successful. Whenever there's a product of uh, high complex, com complexity uh, and there's a handful of people in the world that know how to do that, and there are people that want to consume that, but they don't have the operational expertise to, there's a gap over there. And I think managed service providers fit well. Cisco's doing this, of course. Um, you know, IBM is doing this with Blue Box. There's a lot of a lot of people that yeah. are coming to market with this as well. Um, and then you also have you also have the as a service. So you have DreamHost and uh, arguably Rackspace that are doing the same thing, where they're taking the open source bits and they're providing it as a service that's scalable to the end user and scalable from a, a, a accounting perspective, um, while at the same time they have to hire a bunch of people to manage it themselves. So, so let's talk about the, about one of the other you know models here, uh, Open Core, which seems to be kind of where a lot of people have uh, been drawn to. I think if you ask Cloudera, that's probably what Cloudera would say with uh, uh, Impala and so forth. Um, 
that's certainly what like company like SwiftStack is doing. Um, what, as you guys have been through this and thinking about the challenges with customers, there's this fine line you have to walk with Open Core where you want on the one hand maintain the community and deliver value, but on the other hand, figure out how to get paid. So how, how, do, you, how do you think about that? Uh, that's that's something we um, at Metocore we definitely struggled like what model we go do we go with, um, and I think for us um, a pure pure open model was attractive in some ways, but then we also feared that you know people are just just paying for support and they will be you know they'll be able to calculate more easily what that value is um, versus you know, our our original proprietary model was based on the software, um, not just the support. So we were afraid that people will say why am I paying this same price now that you open sourced it. Um, so that's why we landed on an open core model where there is something visual that you can actually see, you know, you're getting this value add on top and actually does provide value, um, but it's not where most of our development goes. Most of the development still goes in the open source because that's, you know, the, the foundation. But that was kind of our thinking when we, when we went uh, that way. And after we open sourced, um, we didn't see a lot of pushback on the pricing. We didn't change the pricing. We kept everything the same. And you know, we got marketing effects from that, um, and it only helped us. That's interesting, yeah. We had originally built our, our what we th initially called Piston Enterprise OpenStack as if there was going to be an open core distribution, that all of the technology would eventually be opened up in a rolling fashion, um, contributed back to the community. Um, and we tried twice to re to hand back our cloud boot uh, bare metal provisioning system and the OpenStack community wanted to go down a different path and wanted to do um, originally uh, bare metal Nova and that ended up becoming ironic. Um, and so they weren't interested in the technology we'd built and it would have been too difficult for us to have like released it and then retroactively tried to retrofit it into the model that ironic had. And so we didn't actually uh, pursue that. Um, in retrospect, we should have actually provided a mechanism by which it was escrowed, the code was escrowed and then released like automatically. Um, because you, when you're building a business, you get busy and things that aren't immediately important fall off the wayside. That's a good point. On, uh, well, before I answer the ink tank question, on the um, open core model and, uh, and struggles around open core, um, everything tends to when you, when you have a big part of your product that's open and then you have a small sliver, like we had the management layer that was uh, an open piece, I mean a, a proprietary piece. Um, if you're not bringing a whole lot of value at that top layer, um, people really question yeah. why it makes sense for that to be proprietary. And, and I think even over time, even if you do bring value to that layer, what will happen is you'll have the community come up with reactions to that over time because they tend to, if you've got a big enough community, they'll tend to want to create pieces of it that are open, fit within their licensing model, fit within their business without having to have that relationship. So um, we saw that particularly at Ink Tank. So uh, at Ceph as a whole, the whole lifestyle, life cycle of product, everything was 100% open. And it wasn't until Ink Tank came along and particularly towards the last, you know, maybe year of Ink Tank, uh, did we decide to keep a piece and make it proprietary? Uh, and the reaction that the market had to it was interesting. We saw several people come up with management consoles that had similar functionality. We saw uh, a large partner of ours also come up with that. Intel came up with something called Virtual Storage Manager that did that. And there was also some talk at that time. This is back when Intel was doing a lot more software work and had their own distributions. There was talk about Intel doing a distribution of Ceph at that time. Um, so some of that is in reaction to the open core model. Uh, when you go a little bit against the grain of the system, the system pushes back a bit, the market pushes back, and it forces you to change what's open and where you put your value bits and what pieces you can keep proprietary. And really when you capture value or when you create value, you can only capture about 10% of that. Um, Piston was actually working on a component that was going to basically be our version of Calamari because we weren't willing to spend the price that Ink Tank was asking for. And we were really good partners with Ink Tank. I they really tried to sell him. <laughs> <laughs> but our licensing model was actually only $3,500 per node per year. 
which was a lot less than everybody else in the OpenStack ecosystem was charging for their more open uh, open source or the OpenStack deployments and distributions. So there wasn't enough money in our margin to be able to afford to to bundle Calamari. And I think the other the other challenge with open core is um, where do you draw the line of proprietary versus open, and how do you deal with it when the community does encroach on that proprietary bit that you have? Are you fighting against that or are you accepting it? You know, there are a lot of cases of uh, other open core companies in the past where they fought against it, right? And it yeah. caused all kinds of problems. Um, so I think that's, that's something that early on, I think if you can, if you can find a line that's very clear, um, that's not fuzzy so that if you're trying to make a decision on a new feature, you should easily be able to figure out is this an open or closed feature? Um, I think that's important to decide early on because you get busy and you may make compromises later on um, that could hurt you. Clarity of the line is important. Communication of that roadmap in both independent roadmaps because when you have a proprietary piece and a non-proprietary piece, the roadmaps are handled differently. Um, so communication around that roadmap is important. Um, the ability to move the line because as the community comes up with alternatives, you might have to open source what was previously previously proprietary. So that means that you still need to keep good coding habits. You need to make sure that uh, everything that you're doing can be open sourced in a very easy way afterwards. And you have to innovate at the proprietary development piece. So you have to invest in proprietary development if you want to stick with an open core model because you have to continually bring better value to the end user through the proprietary model as a whole. So uh, I think all of those are important things to do if you're going to do open core and do it, do it properly, particularly within the enterprise. Although completely unrelated to the actual act of doing the open core, um, if you ever want to see an engineer clean up code overnight, tell them that they're, you're open sourcing the, the module they're working on, <laughs> and then just stand back. I might not actually be a nice person. I'm not sure. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? What, what do you, why do you guys think enterprises actually value open source? Like what's, what's, we, we know that the trend is undeniable, right, in terms of all that, you know, so much infrastructure is moving to open source, but why, why do they, they value it? They have money, right? They're willing to pay for things. What, what drives it there, do you think? Um, well, I, I used to work at DreamHost, um, and I, I don't know if we represent the standard enterprise. We really had an open first, uh, point of view, particularly being a service provider, margins were uh, very low, so we needed to eke out uh, a lot of margins. We also had a lot of very unique internal systems that uh, uh, being open helped tie into our own management platforms, our own monitoring systems, things of that sort that had years and years of, of work behind it that we needed the flexibility of it. So uh, from a service provider point of view, I can say that it was very important for it to be open, for it to actually even function within an organization. Now, I don't think that's the way that all enterprises have. They don't have that same type of legacy. Uh, but w what I've been seeing is that the uh, infrastructure level of the market is now all tending to be open first. The conversations start at what, what's the open way to do this uh, versus you know, let me use this closed system. Now, sometimes in closed ecosystems where they're only used to that, they don't know how to ask that question, but uh, those workloads seem to be shifting over time. So I, I think that if, if you're building something in this day and age in the infrastructure space, that category, um, you have to answer the question, why be open? And I was having a conversation with somebody else about this. I think unless, if you do build something infrastructure space and you want to further commoditize the market, maybe being open is great. If you do something that builds, uh, is creating a new market, and you have a substantial amount of value uh, over existing open source solutions, then I think proprietary might not be a bad way to go. Yeah, for, for us, um, having, having a, a network plugin in the OpenStack e ecosystem where OpenStack is open source, um, but the networking plugin was not, uh, was causing us you know, problems getting traction in the community with customers um, when there is open alternatives like open vSwitch plugin and DVR and things like this. Um, so, I mean, that was the driver for us um, for open sourcing and it had a major impact, right? We were able to differentiate against other proprietary uh, solutions out there. We got a lot more visibility. 
Um, and it, it basically, you know, checked that box of, okay, you are open, we're not having the lock-in um, problem. It's, you know, it, it just helped us uh, tremendously get a lot more traction. Um, so if you, if you extend it uh, further, if you think about the application layer, right, we talked about this a little bit uh, before, that there's very few open source examples at the application layer, right? With Sugar really being the only one I can kind of think of off the top of my head that's had reasonable success. So why is that? Why, why is it such a different story in infrastructure, yet at the application layer, proprietary rules? The use case, the, peop the people who are actually using the software, the their applications, um, care more about getting things done than being able to prevent being locked in. Like a big part of why enterprises tend toward open on the infrastructure level is the systems administrators and the engineers who are responsible for maintaining the systems have come up in a world where things are tending toward more open. Um, but they also have a an aversion to vendor lock-in that <laughs> your application, your your end user doesn't doesn't have that. I actually was building you know infrastructure software, but I use an iPhone because. I don't want to have to recompile my kernel every time I get a you know firmware update and you know install Cyanogen and then oh no now I have to actually install a kernel update because someone left a 40,000 character password root hack on in the initial thing. I don't want to deal with that. I just want to you know text my wife and you know Facebook with my parents. Um, and at the same level, like your marketing team, your sales team. They just want to get their job done, and the open source alternatives for at the application layer get in the way. I think that on-premise software is uh, the the amount of on-premise software sold versus software as a service sold. You know, the software as a service is starting to dwarf everything else. And if you're going to present something as a service and as an application that is hosted, um, you can consume open all you want, but uh, what people want is an easy way to be able to use it without having to uh, have their IT stuff deployed throughout the enterprise uh, in, in such a heavy way. Like, for example, that's one reason why applications like Expensify are really killing it in the market right now. Because while there's lots of applications that can do that type of work that uh, are internal systems, um, when you have a, a really good hosted platform that is, is thoughtful, has great user experience, that, as Chris said, can get stuff done quickly, your productivity is high because of it, um, people want to use it. And to answer your question, uh, your, your question is a good question, and your ticket is 7,543, um, and we'll get to you in the next 40 to 72 days. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Um, is there any questions from the, the audience? Yeah. Microphone. Oh. Yeah. If you, can, well, um, if you can make it. Maybe, you know, more based from like a, we can repeat it. Um, from, from an investor perspective, um, how do you measure the value of intellectual property um, and how much you want to expose that? Um, do, do you want to open source that? Uh, what is the value? What's the trade off? And how do you look? at that in particular in an investment? Yeah, I'll give my opinion. I'm sure these guys have got an opinion about that too. Uh, I actually may have got a controversial view on that. I actually don't value IP very much, especially in software. I, I, I just don't think there's very much IP. I mean, uh, you know, if we're talking about, you know, Intel and transistor design, yeah, there's some IP there, right? But in, in code, it's just, it's a question of time. I mean, it's just a question of time and engineers. And there's nobody that has a lock on all the great engineers. The, the craziest thing I hear from startups is they think they've got better engineers than you know, Cisco or Red Hat. It's not true, right? They may be able to move at a different pace because maybe they don't have the same organizational constraints. But there's a lot of great engineers out there. And so I actually don't value IP very much. I, I look more towards like, the business issues. So thinking about the open source question, it would be if we were to open source something, uh, what, what value does it drive, right? Is, it, is there a community reason that we're doing it? Are we not going to be able to really get paid for it anyway? <laughs> so even, you know, so someone's self serving. Even if, like, you know, we didn't open source, we really can't charge for it anyway. Well, we may as well open source it then, right? Because then maybe we build a community, we get some additional goodwill and value out of it. So it's more kind of business questions than maybe technical ones. 
So um, I was on the previous panel on being famous in open source. Um, apparently, I am. Um, but Randy Bias actually made a very poignant comment about how in the early stages of building uh, cloud scaling, that all of the customers that he went to didn't it wasn't an open source or closed source thing. They just went and re-implemented. His number one competitor was not Piston, was not Morantis, was not Red Hat, was not you know uh, that other company, Nebula. Um, <laughs> it was companies like Walmart and you know J.P. Morgan Chase and all of these people going and re-implementing the products that we had built. And once you've told someone the idea you have, they will go and do it. Mass and Juju exist because we both cloud scaling and piston sort of paved the way for, oh, that's a great idea. People should be able to bare metal provision stuff and it should be, you know, hands free, seamless. Um, and at a certain point, you have that, you, the, the, the decision is not how valuable is this IP, it's what can I build that's valuable with this IP. Um, an example is Keybase. I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with them. They're an encryption, like, uh, they're making PGP easy. Um, and they just launched a new uh, beta service that's um, peer, or it's basically centralized storage, but it's entirely encrypted on both ends. So if you and I were to decide we're going to share some files, you, I make a, fi a folder on the Keybase file system with your username and my username, and when you come online, we'll mute, our clients will mutually create a key and encrypt all the files. And if I, can, if I upload them first, they'll be encrypted with my key, and then they'll be rekeyed later when you decide to accept my invite. They're not charging for that. It's entirely open source, and one day they will be charging for that because they're finding ways that the, the core IP that's entirely open source, all it's Apache 2, it's all in GitHub, they're finding ways to build value on top of that that's completely separate from the actual code. I, I think these days, it, well, in general, it just comes down to execution. Um, I agree with Ryan. You know, we, we open sourced our stuff, and you know, some people were worried that you know, our competitors will steal our, our ideas around distributed networking or something like that. Didn't happen, right? We actually work with some of the other open source uh, uh, groups out there and guide them on, here's what we did, here's what we learned. They could go look at the code, but they don't because everyone's busy. You know, so in reality, we don't find that people are going and stealing your IP, um, even if you give it all away. Um, you actually have to put effort into spreading it if you want it spread. Also, all your code is in Japanese. and <laughs> <laughs> It's actually Catalonian. Yeah. Sorry. Any other questions? Yeah. So actually, somebody uh, mentioned escrow at one stage, so, and most of the time when you've been talking about business models, you've been talking about the shiny new thing at the beginning, so I'd like the panel to talk a bit about the end of the life cycle, the, the sort of, um, when it's not a shiny new product anymore, but you still need maintenance on it. Are there business models around there that make sense? No. <laughs> not unless you want to get into a services business. Um, if you want to have a scalable business, like, it's expensive. Every piece of like, m every piece of code you build is a debt for the future, and if you have to maintain that forever, it's basically in it's impossible. It's too expensive. So you have to life cycle it. You have to tell people, all right, after a certain point in time, this isn't supported anymore. We'll put the code in escrow. You can maintain it yourself, but don't call us. We'll call you. I mean, I think I mean you know the there are certainly large companies out there like NCR that make quite a bit of money maintaining legacy code bases. Um, but I don't really see that as a in particularly interesting business. And I think it's hard to get into as a small company because you don't have the credibility. The reason NCR wins all the business is because it's NCR and it's their terminal from 1960 that someone's got to do something on, right? Uh, same with you know IBM mainframes. I don't know how big that business is inside of IBM. They sure don't sell many mainframes anymore. They sell a couple. But it's that services group that probably does you know, pretty well. I bet it's incredibly profitable within IBM, is my guess. But it would be hard to start that outside of IBM. Um, because how, how do you get the customer list? How do you know? But it is, I think Chris's point, ultimately going to be a services business. Microsoft has a, has a good business that's an embedded business on Windows 95 still. But uh, I wouldn't call it a growing market. 
<laughs> and I don't think anybody would be terribly excited about it. I actually worked um, at a company that was using Uverse, which was a uh, multi-value key, proto-key value store database, non-relational database from the 70s. Um, that up until like three years ago was owned by IBM, and IBM spun it off and sold it to someone else because it was an expensive business that wasn't making a lot of money. And this company won't move off of it because they tried to move off to something more modern in 2008, and it nearly killed them. I mean, just a part, parting, parting shot from my standpoint, too. I, I'm not so concerned about growth. I mean, it's not going to be a business for me as a venture investor if it's not growing. Uh, because that's just that's what, what I'm looking to go do. But there's plenty of private equity firms that that's their whole business, right? I mean, SolarWinds, if anyone's familiar with, with that company, uh, Tomo Bravo has bought that and has rolled in. There's a service called Pingdom. Maybe some people might be familiar with that. They bought Labrado. They, they basically are bringing together all these disparate pieces, and they're going to milk the uh, service, you know, the, the maintenance stream out of these companies. And they may talk about investing in R&D, but they're not going to invest in R&D. I mean, it's an, it's an asset that's kind of that they're going to basically squeeze the value out of, and that's a profitable model. It's just, it's just not growth. Yeah. Any other questions? So, so question for the, for, the, for the other, for the panel. So we've talked a lot about startups. I think we're all geared towards startups. Uh, you know, Ben, you may be starting now to go to the dark side. I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, but I think that with that beard, he's moving to the desert. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe. I don't know. I'm just happy I'm sitting next to someone famous. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. <laughs> um, there's a lot of big companies that have come into the OpenStack ecosystem, uh, and uh, certainly from you know 2010 days, which you know uh, Chris was there at the at the very all well, you guys were there at the at the beginning. Um, how do the big companies best leverage open source from a business model standpoint? Because they're, they're in this unique position. They don't necessarily need to make any money from open source. It can drive, I don't know, hardware sales or something else. Like how, if you were inside you know, a, big, a big company today, whether it be IBM or HP or Cisco or Dell or EMS, what advice or how would you sort of think about the open source business question? I think that what we're seeing right now is we're seeing a lot of big companies getting into OpenStack. I've heard this, actually Chris, you brought up this term earlier uh, about uh, the idea of some people look at OpenStack as a lost leader. Yeah. Uh, and they're attaching it to, because they have other things that they can sell. There's hardware and switches and professional services or whatever. but. There's a lot of complexity in this, and the amount of engineering work it takes to continually maintain this and have, have a team that um, can deliver good quality product and be competitive is very expensive. So if people look at it as a loss leader, that means that the price on these services or price on these things can go to free. It's not a sustainable business model. So what I predict over time is that if that is the goal, of some of these larger companies, just like they tried to do that with Linux in the past before, I don't believe it's going to be a sustainable model. And I think that only pure play platforms are going to be able to succeed in that space. Uh, there will be an ecosystem of other people, of course, services providers and uh, people who might want to consume it. But uh, I, I think from a, from a top line perspective here, we'll probably see a shakeout and there'll be a, a handful of companies left standing and these are the ones that uh, have core value in building these open source systems and distributing it. Do you want to talk? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think for some of the large companies who um, are trying to do things like build their own public cloud, um, that you could debate whether that's you know, a good thing to, for them to do or not. Um, but for these companies trying to go down that road, um, it, there's a lot of logic for them to embrace that and build up the expertise in-house because um, they can control their own destiny. But on the other hand, is this going to be successful for them anyways? Yeah, I don't know. But, but I think that, that that's why they're doing it. But well, I probably wouldn't do that if I were, if I were them, personally. So I'm going to take somewhat the opposite approach. I'm actually an OpenStack skeptic. And I have been since I founded it in 2011, sorry, 2010. Uh, at the Austin Summit. I was one of the four, four of the 12 technical talks that were there. Um, and I've been amazed at watching how it's grown. Um, but 
if I were one of the big companies, I would be building an, a public cloud and taking one of my existing revenue streams and putting it on there and saying, if you want to adopt this revenue stream in cloud, um, you have to use ours. There's a large database company in Redwood Shores. Is that where they're located? Um, so it starts there, with an O, ends with Ruckel. Uh, they're building a cloud. They're using OpenStack as their development environment to do so. Um, and they're going to put Oracle on the, or sorry, their database onto this platform. And if you want to use this database in cloud, you'll be using them. And they have a large enough revenue stream. This is a business, a legacy business that's making them lots and lots of money. And it allows them to move wholly into a new cloud-based ecosystem while still not abandoning or orphaning their existing revenue stream. So if I were HP, IBM, Cisco, I would be doing that as well. What is one piece of software technology that we can move entirely into the cloud, and how can we leverage our own ownership of that revenue stream to make this cloud money? Do I think about it? Any, I saw a question over here. Yeah, quick. Um, everybody, just remember that I didn't say that O word. <laughs> it's not on tape. <laughs> <laughs> It's not a, it's not a question so much as um, adding on to the, the question that was just posed, because uh, I used to work for HP and I work for Red Hat now. So I found your question to be very interesting. Just wanted to share what I have seen HP do, what I saw HP do. So HP has um, the software arm, you know, their own proprietary software. So the strategy that I saw work there to some extent was let's complement, let's go leverage open source components to kind of complement the HP proprietary software stack. That was one. But what I found more interesting was internally within HP to kind of drive that open source mindset. So kind of have an intranet of open source uh, you know, uh, stores and uh, you know, getting the employees to collaborate more using the open source culture. So that was something else that I saw HP do. I'm not saying it made them a lot of money, but that was an interesting application of the cultural aspects. That was it. And if I was HP, the, uh, the, the revenue stream that I would move entirely into the cloud would be the reverse polis notation calculators that they had in the 70s. <laughs> I think that one's got wings. It's a killer application. Yeah. I'd put it in the container. <laughs> <laughs> all right, with that, I, I see it's, it's, it's 420. Listen, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you, our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.